All right, I think we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Once again, my name is Eric. I'm an AmeriCorps member with CRWP. Um, we are joined today by Megan Hart of Lake Metro Parks. Um, the session is being recorded, so if you want to go back and watch it at any time, you can. We'll post it to our uh, CRWP webpage. Um, you can use the Q&A chat feature on the right to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, and with that, I think I will turn it over to Megan. Good morning, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about something that's near and dear to my heart, and that's planting native plants uh, to manage not only for pollinators, but for other types of wildlife. And with that, let's get started. So a question I get asked quite often is why manage for earlier open successional areas? Wasn't all this once a very wooded area, you know, wasn't it just constant woodland? But the fact of the matter is habitat is not static and has never been static. So there was always different types of disturbances that would come in and cause canopy gaps, which would allow meadows to thrive. Things like fires from occasional lightning strikes, uh, beaver impoundments that would eventually become abandoned would become wet meadows over time windstorms, river scouring, damage from insects, uh, fungus, and other diseases would all allow these early successional habitats to exist on the landscape. And this allowed for these species to thrive here in the eastern United States. This is an excellent uh, figure brought on by uh, Revive and Restore. So this is looking at a canopy disturbance event. And this is looking at a natural disturbance event caused by the passenger pigeon. Passenger pigeons would come through an area and their voracious foraging would often leave open canopy gaps. And what would happen is that grasses and wildflowers would move into these areas, which would allow species like Eastern meadowlarks, pollinators, different types of sparrows to come in and use these areas. But over time, forest succession would continue on through these areas. So you would get more and more shrubs moving in. This would move into timber and eventually the canopy would become closed. So those species that were there at the very beginning of the canopy disturbance would eventually fade out over time and be replaced by other species. And this is a natural process. Once uh, humans really started coming on the landscape, uh, before European colonization, native peoples used fire to keep areas open to manage for hunting, crop fields and orchards, and keep settlement areas open. So they had been practicing habitat management uh, for time immemorial in these areas. Once European settlers came on the scene, they created more and more open areas for agriculture and settlement. So we were seeing a lot of forest areas being cut back and more and more of these open field areas come on the scene. And this helped to increase open and early successional species in the area like bobolink that use these farm fields. Prior to heavy European influence, a lot of these species were likely more transient uh, where they would move from one canopy gap to the other. In modern times, we are seeing the loss of quite a bit of our early successional habitat. Uh, in recent years, there are just less and less open areas that are found on the landscape. And this is due to a variety of factors. One is actually the loss of small scale agriculture and changes in the way that we farm. So we've moved from small family farms that would have kept areas fallow from year to year to more of this large scale agriculture that is more fence row to fence row farming. And so early successional species in these smaller farms would have used these fallow fields in these hedgerow areas to exist. Another thing that we're seeing is increasing urban and suburban areas. Old farm fields make excellent areas to put suburbs. And with us moving into these areas, invasive species have become more and more of a problem and they do readily colonize open and disturbed spaces, which ends up degrading the habitat. In addition, we have the natural process of forest secession, which is still happening on the landscape. The difference is, is that these old farm fields and these open areas undergo forest succession, but there's no natural disturbance really that comes in and helps open up the canopy as much anymore because we are doing fire suppression. 
we don't really allow beavers to get to the point where wet meadows typically form. And so because we've had such an impact on the different habitats on the landscape, um, you know, we're starting to see the impact of this. A great study came out in 2019 known as the Three Billion Birds Papers, and it really shook scientists and citizens alike. Um, the main results of the study is that we have lost three billion uh, breeding birds in North America since 1970. And this is not just declines in these rare specialist species, but our common species that uh, we get maybe at our feeders are declining and also non-native species like European starlings are also declining. And what this is showing is that landscapes are losing their ability to support bird populations, which is extremely serious. But I will say that this paper did highlight some wonderful things about conservation efforts that have helped to bring some birds back from the brink. Waterfowl have increased by 56%, and that's thanks to efforts through things like Ducks Unlimited and conservation dollars going to uh, support waterfowl for hunting. There's also hawks and eagles have increased by 78% and osprey have quadrupled, and that's thanks to the banning of things like DDT and other environmental legislation. But from this study, one of the main reasons that were highlighted for decline of bird species was loss of habitat. And I always say that a bird cannot exist on the landscape if that habitat is not there. So some other great things that came out of this study is that it showed that migratory birds have declined by 2.5 billion since 1970. That's a 28% population loss. And migratory birds use open areas for foraging during migration. And there are migratory bird species that also use these areas for breeding. In addition, aerial insectivores have declined by 160 million and have that's a population decrease of 32%. So two in five barn swallows have been lost since 1970. Um, barn swallows are one of those species that use early successional uh, meadow areas to hunt. And uh, so all this kind of compounds to the point that we get to looking at just grassland birds. Grassland birds have declined by 720 million individuals since 1970. That's a population decrease of over 53%. And this is extraordinarily serious. So a common species, Eastern meadowlark, you used to be able to see these in all kinds of agricultural areas. You used to not be able to go by a telephone wire or fence row in farmland without seeing Eastern meadowlarks. Well, three and four of these birds are gone since 1970 and they're one of our species that are uh, actually experiencing pretty rapid decline. So all this kind of focuses in that open areas across the Eastern United States that can sustain early successional and grassland species are becoming increasingly rare. Grassland early successional insectivore, insectivorous species, pollinators and open adapted plant and animal species are all exhibiting declines. And most of our open areas that do exist on the landscape are overrun with invasives and are considered to be ecological sinks for pollinators, birds, and other species. So now if we look at pollinator decline, uh, there's less studies done in North America on this when, when compared to the U United Kingdom, but we do know that 49 native bee species are declining in the Northeastern United States with seven of these listed as rare and endangered. A study done here in Ohio over 21 years of looking at uh, butterfly surveys found that total butterfly abundance on the surveys declined by 33% over the 20 years in Ohio. That's a 2% decline per year, which aligns very closely to what is being seen in Europe. And what's really serious is that they found declines in common species like American copper, European skipper, which is a non-native species, common wood nymph and orange sulfur. And so this is aligning with what we're seeing with birds, that it's not just the rare specialist species that are declining, it's also the common species. And what was highlighted from this study was that it's habitat loss and fragmentation is one of the main causes of pollinator decline, as well as climate change, agricultural intensification and disease. And so if we look at this figure by the Xerces Society, 
we can see that 28% of bumblebee species are in decline. 19% of butterflies are at risk of extinction in the United States. A common lady beetle called the nine spotted lady beetle is now locally extinct from many states where it was once plentiful, while 27 non-native lady beetle species have become established since the mid 1980s. 50% of leafcutter bees are at risk and 27% of mason bee species at risk. So this is really serious whenever you look at the importance of pollinators to us on the and to the natural world. So pollinators are great. They provide natural food sources for wildlife through pollinating plants and which provides fruits and seeds to feed on. Besides that, they themselves are food for insectivores, for birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and other insects. There have been studies that show that caterpillars are a crucial food source for young nestlings to aid in their development. In addition to that, they're important for our food sources. So they're extraordinarily important for agriculture. The, re uh, the added revenue to crop production from pollinators is currently valued at $18 billion. And native pollinators can do specialized pollination. So if you love tomatoes, potatoes, blueberries, eggplant, all of these need a specialized type of pollination called buzz pollination, which is only done by our native species. So European honeybees, for example, can't do buzz pollination. And so species like bumblebees are needed to pollinate things like tomatoes. So when we think of pollinators, of course, our mind usually goes immediately to bees and usually to this little guy down here, the European honeybee. They, we have a love affair with them. They produce food for us uh, through pollinating our plants, but they also produce food for us through honey. However, you know, it is a non-native species that we've brought over and it's important to recognize that pollinators are also native. We've got a lot of wonderful native bees. Uh, We've got, you know, our bumblebees, which are important for that buzz pollination I was just talking about. Uh, one of my favorite local bees is the two-spotted longhorned bee. It uh, pollinates uh, flowers that need longer tongued beads to pollinate them. And then one of my ultimate favorite uh, bees, the blue orchard bees, we affectionately know them as bobs. They are uh, extremely wonderful pollinators. In fact, 400 blue orchard bees can do the same work in an almond orchard that 15,000 honeybees can do. And so there's a shift to realizing that these native species can provide us a whole lot of benefit uh, by using them in agricultural settings. Also, when we think of pollinators, we think of butterflies. Uh, these are some local butterflies you can see. We've got many more species. But it's also important to realize that moths are also important pollinators like the hummingbird clearwing, which is a common visitor to gardens. In addition, uh, a lot of people don't really think of flies as pollinators, but they're important uh, pollinators, especially for our spring ephemeral wildflowers. Uh, here's a couple of flower flies. Uh, a lot of people think of them as corn flies or hover flies, and they kind of get a bad rap because they get lumped in there with sweat bees and people think that they can sting you but they're an extremely important pollinator. In fact, if you go out this summer and look at many of our native plant species, you'll see flower flies on there pollinating them. And then the fan favorite uh, pollinator, ruby-throated hummingbird. We love this pollinator so much, we hang up fake flowers with sugar water to provide food for them. So it's important to know that native plants do equal a healthier landscape. Uh, native plants require less water than lawns do. They help prevent erosion. They have very deep roots and uh, are better at erosion control than many of the non-natives that have historically been planted for erosion control. They also provide shelter and food for wildlife throughout the year, and they help to, permit, to promote biodiversity and stewardship. And the best thing is that they are adapted to the local climate so they can handle more of those climatic swings than some of non-native plants can. So uh, let's talk about what's been going on in the landscape. From 1982 to 1997, more than 10 million acres of land in the United States were converted to developed land. 
And we have 40 million acres of lawn in the United States alone. That is a huge amount. And if you look at this photo, I mean, lawns are very attractive. Um, we have, we absolutely love our lawns. But if you look at it from a pollinator or a wildlife standpoint, there's not a whole lot of food here or shelter uh, from the elements or other predators. And this has really been demonstrated by a paper done in 2018 out of the Washington DC area, looking at the uses of native plants versus non-native plants in residential areas. They found that residential yards dominated by non-native plants have lower arthropod abundance, forcing resident Carolina chickadees to switch diets to less preferred prey, and they produce fewer young in these areas or forgo reproduction in non-native sites altogether. So essentially areas with higher non-native plants have lower Carolina chickadee reproductive success. So there's less of those chicks that are making it out of the nest and unsustainable population growth in those areas when compared to uh, landscapes that use more than 70% native plant biomass. The bottom line is areas with high proportions of non-native plants are just population sinks. And that is where the birds or other species are not producing enough young to benefit the population as a whole. So it's important that we kind of start shifting our perspective that that lawn looked very clean, very attractive. We also need to realize that this image here with all these plants is also extremely important and can be considered attractive as well. Native plants support wildlife, that is the bottom line. Native plants tend to be way more nutritious. A study looking at invasive uh, fruits versus native fruits uh, found that invasive fruits tend to have lower fat content and native fruits fat contents tend to range from six to 48%. Now for us, we're like, oh, fat's bad. We as humans tend to think of fatty foods as not being great for us, but fat is crucial for migrating birds to fuel their journey. Prior to migrating, they eat a whole lot of foods to make these fat deposits on their body. And there's been studies showing that if they do not have enough fat on their bodies to fuel migration, a lot of these birds don't end up making it through the migration over the Gulf. Golden rods are typically thought of as kind of weedy plants. A lot of people don't like them. They get a bad rap. People think that they're the ones that give them their seasonal allergies when really it's ragweed. But golden rods are really important on the landscape. They support 115 butterfly and moth species in the US Mid-Atlantic. They also support 11 native bee species and help monarchs on their fall migration. And they produce lots of seeds for wintering songbirds to use in the lean months. And besides this, numerous species utilize native plants besides pollinators, deer, turkey, migratory songbirds, other insects, mammals, they all use native plants. Here are some great examples over here to the left of non-pollinator species using native plants. So the Pennsylvania ambush bug usually crawls up on a flower head and waits for pollinating insects to come by, which it then snacks on. Dogbane leaf beetle needs dogbane uh, for its life cycle. Same thing with milkweed beetle and swamp milkweed beetle both need milkweed to feed on. And this spring peeper here is waiting for little insects to come visit this plant. So let's get into talking about pollinator plantings. So pollinator and grassland plantings can raise in size from small uh, garden plots and uh, acre, you know, below like an acre to 100 plus acres. So really there's a size of pollinator planting for everybody. Smaller scale plantings are great for foraging sites for pollinators and songbirds. They help to reduce lawn space, convert unused space into something more beneficial. So areas like along sidewalks, unused corners of spaces like around picnic areas, along building edges are all great places to put pollinator plantings and also help reduce the amount of lawn that you're mowing. Small patches of pollinator plantings can also be used similar to food plots. Um, a lot of landowners are planting these for game species instead of the traditional food plot that used crops instead to draw them in. 
Adding native plants to your landscaping or gardening can also improve diversity, aesthetics, and food for wildlife. So it does not have to be a huge landscape scale change. If your main goal is to increase aesthetics and provide an area for butterflies and bees, this is an absolute excellent option to add to your landscape. It's also great for educational spaces, teaching gardens, or just enjoying uh, the outdoors. So this idea has been put forth by Doug Ptolemy of creating a homegrown national park with the idea that this is a lot of small efforts by many people to make a difference for wildlife on the landscape. So he has said, in the past, we have asked one thing of our gardens that they be pretty. Now they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and also manage water. So we're having to look at this in a different way for our gardens. To help our wildlife, an effort needs to be made on public lands, but also on private lands to make the landscape friendlier for wildlife as a whole. So now if we look at larger plantings, uh, these can be planting sections or entire old fields. Uh, these larger spaces typically provide better breeding habitat for bird species, which usually need larger spaces to support nesting efforts and territory. They can also support a higher number of species diversity on the landscape. And larger pl plantings can be specifically designed with additional species in mind. So you can design your planting for a specific grassland or early successional bird species. So this is more along the lines of doing a habitat restoration. Regardless of the size you wanna plant, you are still gonna be providing important food sources and habitat for wildlife. So let's look at using uh, pollinator plantings for creating breeding bird habitat for grassland species. So this is something that I've done in my previous job and that we're also gonna be doing here at Lake Metro Parks. So you, use, you end up ta tailoring your pollinator planting to meet those species requirement. But it's important to know that not all pollinator plantings are going to benefit whatever species you have in mind. This is not a one size fits all situation. A good example is something that I had to deal with in my previous job doing habitat restoration on private lands. Uh, two of our main species that we were doing habitat restorations for were northern bobwhite and henslow sparrow. They're both love grassland settings. However, both these birds, uh, they have wildly, wildly different um, habitat requirements. So henslow sparrow up here in the upper left corner needs areas of at least 50 acres, but really and truly loves areas more in the 80 acre range. They don't like to have shrubs in these area and they need to have thick growing grasses and forbs with little to no bare ground. So like they like to have a dense vegetative mat. Northern bobwhite on the other hand, needs areas with very uh, sparse kind of grasses and forbs. They need areas of bare ground for chicks to run through. Since their chicks are able to, whenever they hatch, they're able to move through the landscape immediately, but they can't fly. And even adults, they prefer to escape predators through running through the vegetation. And with this, it's important for bobwhite that they have to have in shrubs included to make what's called a heavy covey headquarters to protect from weather and predators. So when you're managing uh, with pollinator plantings for grassland bird habitat, it's important to note that species usage changes as succession stages continue. So once you plant your pollinator planting, succession is gonna continue on. So what's good for the Eastern Meadowlark and Bobolink is not gonna be great for Henslow sparrows there at the beginning, but it will move into that. And then eventually, if you leave them and uh, the woody species start moving in, the vines start moving in, that's when you start to get your scrub shrub species like common yellowthroat and yellow-breasted chat. The habitat for common yellowthroat and yellow-breasted chat cannot support eastern meadowlark and bobolink and henslow sparrow. So you have to decide what specific early successional periods you want to manage for and how long you want to go between those management cycles. So let's get into the components of a pollinator mix. So it's important to consider your different bloom periods. Pollinator mixes usually consist of plants in each of the three bloom periods. You have your early, which is late spring to early summer. Some great plants to include in that would be like foxglove beard tongue and Ohio spiderwort. 
you have your mid period, which is your summer, which would be like black eyed Susan. And then you have your late, which is late summer to early fall, which would be things like your New England aster and your golden rods. And it's also important to include native grasses uh, because it provides structural complexity, building materials for nests, additional cover and shelter for wintering insects and wildlife. So by designing your city mix like this, it provides food for pollinators throughout the active months. And by leaving the standing dead plants in the winter, you provide food through the leftover seeds and shelter from the elements. Another thing to consider when making your pollinator mix is including color diversity. So choosing pollinator plants with a variety of color helps to attract different types of pollinators. So your hummingbirds and your butterflies love those brightly colored plants. Uh, red, yellow, orange, purple, pink flowers really tend to draw them in. So things like cardinal flower are something excellent to include. Bees are attracted to purple, yellow, and white. So obedient plant is an excellent choice. You can actually see down here in the right lower right hand corner, there's an Eastern bumblebee pollinating this obedient plant. And flies like green, white, or cream flowers. So whenever you're planning your pollinator planting, you need to go take a good close look at where you're planning to plant it. So not all plants are gonna do well at any planting site. Soil mo moisture is a crucial factor to know. You need to know how wet that area gets. So if it gets really wet with standing uh, water, some plants are gonna do real well there and others are not. So things like swamp rose mallow like to have what we call its feet wet. It does not matter having standing water and moisture soils, but it would not do in a real dry area. And there's plenty of tolerant plants out there as well. Uh, they still probably would not want constant flooding or constant drought, but it can, but there's plenty of plants that can take those wet conditions and also dry conditions. So another important part of site conditions is also knowing how much sunlight that area is getting. So you need to know, or do you have shade, part shade, full sun? And it's important for choosing what plants are adapted for that. So many of the commonly included species in pre-made wildflower mixes need at least eight hours of sun. So a good example of more of a shade loving plant would be like white snake root would do well, but it probably would not do great in really uh, full sun for the majority of the day. So when you're thinking about designing a pollinator mix for specific pollinators, there's some things you need to take into consideration. A good example is monarch. So a monarch seed mix always needs to include at least one of the milkweed plants. This is the monarch's host plant, which it needs to feed on as a caterpillar. Other wildflowers also need to be added as well to provide food for adults and other beneficial insects. And an important component of that is including fall flowers to uh, provide food during the southern migration. Many pollinators have different preferred host plants. If there is a specific pollinator that you are trying to encourage, you need to make sure that you do the research on what plants they need to feed on. So here are some excellent examples of butterflies and their host plants. A black swallowtail, for example, likes to feed on golden Alexander, which is down here in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, monarchs love to feed on their milkweed, like I just said. Pearl crescents love aster, so like this New England aster would be excellent to plant. Viceroys love cottonwoods, willows, aspen, cherry, apple, and plum, and you can see a viceroy down here in the lower right-hand corner on a cottonwood. And other uh, butterflies like red spotted purple need tree species like black cherry, willow, serviceberry, and hawthorn. Spicebush swallowtail needs of course, spice bush or sassafras. So now looking at some of the common pollinator plants included in a pollinator planting or a pollinator seed mix, um, usually one of the milkweeds is included. I've put two here on this slide. There's butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed does a little bit better in wetter areas. And uh, this is great for, of course, for your monarchs, but other for also butterflies and other beneficial insects. Purple coneflower is also usually included. It's a great pop of color and is usually a fan favorite. And gray-headed coneflower are one of the other coneflowers. And black-eyed Susan are also usually included because not only do they provide food for pollinators, but in the fall and winter months, they also provide 
food through their seeds. In fact, goldfinches absolutely love to eat the seeds from coneflowers and black-eyed Susans. Wild bergamot is a favorite of mine to put in a pollinator mix. Uh, it really attracts butterflies and bees. The other name for this plant is bee balm, and usually they're absolutely covered in pollinators. So it's important to know that some plants in your pollinator mix are gonna take off in that first year. So things like purple coneflower is great to plant for that pop of color in that first year. Black-eyed Susans get going that first year. Obedient plant does really well in the first year. So this is actually a photo taken at Lake Metro Parks of a planting we did in December, 2020. And the following summer in 2021, the field was absolutely full with obedient plant. The two over here on the left, Illinois bundle flower and partridge pea are both planted for not just pollinators, but also for wildlife plantings. So they provide really nutritious seeds and they take off really, really quickly. Now it's important with both of these that you would not wanna do high rates of these in your mix because it can easily take over the landscape and push out your other wildflowers. And like some get started in that first year, some plants might need to take a couple years to show up. So don't get, get discouraged with that. Uh, milkweeds often use, usually need to take a couple years before they really start to flower. Same thing with blue false indigo and uh, one of my favorites, blazing star, uh, that's in the liatris genus. Uh, usually takes around two years to really get going, but the payoff is incredible and it really draws in a lot of butterflies and bees to these areas. And another one of my favorites, Rattlesnake Master, usually takes around two years. This is a very strange looking plant that is native to the Eastern United States um, that really draws in pollinators. And there are some specific pollinators that actually need this to complete their life cycle. So whenever you're thinking of pollinator plantings, you might not think about adding shrubs, but they can actually be super beneficial. So whenever you add shrubs to your planting, you're helping to soften edges, uh, provide a more continuous, contiguous area, especially if you're planting near a wooded area. Uh, it helps to provide shelter from inclement conditions and predators, additionally, additional nesting areas and pupating areas for pollinators and birds, uh, food in the form of fruit, nectar, and insects, and it does increase the height diversity in your planting. Uh, some of my favorite shrubs to plant is nine bark, a uh, button bush is absolutely gorgeous. It sometimes need a little bit more of a moist so soil. And then elderberry is great to plant. Uh, they really produce these really nutritious berries that birds just love. So with shrubs, you may need to consider if your specific species can handle shrubs. Uh, like I'd mentioned earlier, Henslow sparrows absolutely cannot take having a lot of shrubs in uh, their habitat, whereas Northern bobwhite, it is a habitat requirement. So let's talk about placement of your pollinator plantings. So pollinator plantings are an excellent way to add for migratory bird stopover habitat. Areas along lakes, rivers, wetlands, and ponds make for excellent stopover habitat. And a good quality pollinator planting can really make your backyard or your property become a migratory bird hotspot. Pollinator plantings placed in a mosaic of habitats like near existing forest is also beneficial. So this provides foraging for edge, edge species like indigo bunting, uh, placement near tree host species for pollinators that, that uh, use those trees to pupate and to uh, complete its life cycle on like oaks, black cherry, and spice bush. And also placement near the forest provides additional escape cover for species that are using this area to forage, things like rabbit, um, it allows an escape route away from predators. Smaller pollinator plantings placed near buildings, walkways, and other human-dominated landscapes can really help aesthetics and provide opportunities for education and increase food sources for pollinators in areas that have really low plant diversity. So with planting your pollinator planting, it's important that you need to suppress any non-native vegetation. Uh, this gives your planting a better chance at success and keeps invasives from taking advantage of the open ground. You also need to have good soil contact with your mix to increase the rate of germination. And this can be achieved through larger areas being burned. But I realize that this is not an option for many people. So also doing a light 
disking or rototilling can also allow that uh, soil contact. Smaller plots like in gardens can be smothered using cardboard covered with mulch. This allows the vegetation underneath to die off in a great area to sow seed. And the best time to plant your pollinator planting is fall, but a winter or very early spring planting can also be successful. So planting into existing vegetation in the summer is possible, but you really do run the risk of other species out competing the wildflower mix, especially since some of the wildflowers are a little bit slower growing. So when we look at management of your pollinator planting, you're going to have to do some in order to keep it open. So periodic mowing or brush removal to keep areas open and woody vegetation back, depending on what your management goals are, is important. Uh, you can also do top clipping to keep uh, invasive species knocked back. That's where you clip the seed heads off or the flowering heads off, which allows your native plants to uh, kind of catch up a little bit more. A uh, burning, uh, if possible, is a great way to set it back to a grassland setting. It's a very natural way to do it, and it can also help with invasive control. If burning is not possible, periodic disking does mimic fire and resetting the landscape, and you will need to do periodic invasives control. So many invasives love open disturbed areas, and every time you disturb the soil, it opens the door for invasives to thrive. Things like autumn olive, and Bradford calorie pear move into open areas very, very quickly. And so those are some of the ones that you'd have to keep an eye on. Uh, you will need to occasionally spot spray, burn, or hand pull to remove invasives from your landscape. So when conducting any sort of management on a pollinator planting, it's always good to leave a part undisturbed to be managed the following year. General rule of thumb for doing habitat management is you wanna leave one third of the area undisturbed which allows for escape cover and food to persist throughout the year. It's also, you want to avoid conducting heavy management in the summer nesting months. Um, this is an absolute critical time when birds are expending a lot of energy raising a brood in the nest. Most of our songbirds have what's called altricial young, which means they're pretty helpless whenever they hatch out and that it takes two to three weeks before they can really leave the nest. Pollinators are also active during this time. So, uh, it's best to just not create a whole lot of disturbance to these species during the most active months. Without, as I mentioned earlier, without management, your pollinator and grassland plantings will eventually fade out over time as woody species take over. And if your goal is to keep pollinators and early successional birds on your landscape, you will have to choose a time uh, when it is right for you to create some sort of disturbance to set back succession so you can keep those species. So in conclusion, it's really up to all of us to provide habitat and food for pollinators and other wildlife. Each of us can really make a difference through planting native plants, encouraging and educating others to plant native in your community and avoid planting in, uh, invasive species or also removing those existing invasive species off of your landscape. Even a small scale change uh, is gonna make a world of difference for wildlife. So I wanna leave you with this. This is one of our plantings at Lake Metro Parks. And I'm sure some people drive by it and think, man, that's a weedy mess. You know, that doesn't look great. But, you know, I want us all to start shifting our perspective on beauty. You know, let's rethink our definition of beauty that it just doesn't have to be lawn. That having these areas of native plants with wonderful blooming flowers that provide a lot of important resources for our wildlife is also beautiful and useful. And with that, I will open it up to any questions anybody may have. Thank you very much, that was awesome. Um, really shocking to see the decline in the number, you know, the number of our, our bird species. That was, you know, to see it, see it played out like that is really, a, really quite a shock. Um, so just a reminder for people, you can use the uh, question and answer uh, chat box on the right hand side of your screen if you'd like to ask some questions. Um, Robbie wants to know what are some invasive species to watch out for? Absolutely. So there is a whole host of invasive species you need to watch out for on open landscapes. I mentioned autumn olive, Bradford pear, 
A uh, bush honeysuckle is something you also need to watch out for. It's pretty, gets started pretty well. Multiflora rose also gets started in open areas. Um, more herbaceous species. Uh, there is a species that is starting to take off here and elsewhere in the eastern United States. Uh, it's got a good foothold in the southeast. It's called Ceresia lespedeza. Uh, that's a really terrible non-native plant. The seeds can actually exist in the seed bank uh, for 15 years. So uh, once you have a problem, it's constantly a battle. Um, besides that, looking out for reed canary grass is also great. If you have a wetter field, uh, knocking back Phragmites is also very important. Phragmites, one of the worst. Um, Barbara wants to know what resource is there to identify appropriate native grasses? Can you point us to uh, perhaps a website or flyer? Absolutely. So a lot of your uh, local natural resource conservation offices have great uh, literature out there on local native grasses. Um, also, looking at uh, native plant providers locally uh, usually have grasses that are locally adapted for this area. Those are all great to look at. Um, generally, great grasses to look at for this area are the different types of blue stem switchgrass, Indian grass. And if you want a shorter option, a great one is deer tongue grass. It usually stays a little bit shorter and it looks like it's a non-native Asiatic species because it kind of mimics bamboo, but it's uh, great for wildlife and is very nutritious. Awesome. Um, Kathleen says, this is perhaps the best program on this subject I have seen, and I've seen a lot of them. Um, could I give out your email at the end in a follow-up? Would, uh, would you be willing to share your contact info? Absolutely. I would uh, enjoy hearing all your comments or getting some of your questions. That would be great. Perfect. So I'll, I'll include that at the end. Um, I was also really surprised at the, uh, the specific colors. I had never realized um, certain animals and insects prefer. Uh, so it, it just highlights that, uh, like you were saying, the variety throughout the season, early to mid to late. Um, Can you spell that one invasive plant you mentioned that is starting to show up around Ohio? Sir, okay. Sure, so Ceresia lespedeza. So it's it's a mouthful. Um, so Ceresia is spelled S-E-R-I-C-E-A, and then lespedeza is L-E-S-P-E-D-E-Z-A. Um, so there are native lespedezas that are absolutely great and you can include in your pollinator planting. But Ceresia is not, it was actually originally planted ironically for bobwhite quail and other wildlife. And uh, the seeds are actually not nutritious for them at all. There's been studies on Northern bobwhites that have starved to death. And whenever they uh, do an autopsy, their stomachs and their crops are full of Ceresia seeds. So they starve to death by eating that plant. So, um, it's a problem that we thought we were, you know, uh, we thought we were planting this plant to help wildlife and it's turned out that, you know, non-native plants are not super nutritious and uh, we um, now are trying to put that back in the box and remedy that decision. Interesting. It's, it's always kind of funny when, you know, you, you think you're doing the right thing, but it's, it can be so hard, uh, you know, wildlife management, it really is a science. Um, but I think that's all the questions we have. Um, if you had a comment or a question that we didn't get to, um, please feel free to email either of us. Um, I'll be sure to include all of our contact info in the uh, follow-up email. Um, but Megan Hart from Lake Metro Parks, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad I could share my passion for using native plants on the landscape. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was fantastic. That was awesome to see. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for watching um, and keep an eye out for that follow-up email with a link to the recording and, uh, and the contact info. So thank you everyone. Have a great day. Take care.